Excellent. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Arik Burakovsky, as I think most of you know at this point. I manage the Russia and Eurasia program here at Fletcher, and I'm very pleased to have you join us for our conversation today with a distinguished speaker, uh, Alexandra Rokapienka. Uh, she is one of the most astute experts on Russia's political economy, and this conversation will be about the economic, social, and global reverberations of Russia's long war. We'll talk about how the Russian economy is shifting to a wartime footing as its invasion of Ukraine goes on, how the war has affected Russian elites and created a new class of proprietors, how sanctions have changed Russia's economic policy, the future of Russia's economy, what all of this means for Russian society and the economic repercussions for Europe and the rest of the world. Alexandra Prokopienka is a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Russia Eurasia Center. She is a visiting fellow at the Center for Order and Governance in Eastern Europe, Russia, and Central Asia at the German Council on Foreign Relations. In her research, she focuses on Russian government policymaking on economic and financial issues. From 2017 until early 2022, she worked at the Central Bank of Russia and at the National Research University Higher School of Economics in Moscow. Uh, and she is a former columnist for Vietnamese newspaper. So Alexandra will give a short presentation on her latest research. Uh, then I will ask her several questions and then we will invite questions from the audience from all of you. So Alexandra, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Eric, for your kind introduction. Uh, hi, uh, uh, th thank you everyone for having me here. I won't bother you with slides because I, I'm a journalist on my previous life. I'm uh, the worst slide maker in the world, so that would be ugly. <laughs> but uh, if you need some clarifications on figures or whatever, please uh, interrupt me. I will uh, do them. So by now we are... Uh, so war passed its um, 600 days mark, and uh, it is very, uh, it's very odd to find out, to figure out that in the middle of 25th century, one of the, well, not major, but big economy, e economics in, uh, in the world, uh, big um, uh, to turns into uh, uh, turns into the war pass. So the war became existential not only for the stance of Putin's regime, well, because uh, he puts an ontology and he uh, he creates a narrative trying to show that the war is so so, so that it's it's not the war of Russia against Ukraine, but it's the war between uh, good and bad, some sort of. Uh, uh, Russia and the West, uh, but in terms of economy, uh, the war became existential for Russian economy either. So it is a structural shift and it is a great uh, handcrafted structural shock uh, which Russian economy face now. If you will, uh, I if you will look at the state budget, and that's the first document you need to examine it if you want to um, find out the priorities of the government, uh, well, not, not only for Russia, but for every country. So the priorities of Russian government uh, for the next year would be financing the war in Ukraine, uh, spending money on uh, security and services, integrated occupied territory, uh, 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 occupied territories into Russia, and uh, social handouts. First time in the modern Russian history since uh, 1991, uh, military expenses combined with expenses on social security uh, exceeded expenses on um, um, it, it, uh, no, no, military expenses and expenses on uh, security services. So that's national security and military combined. They were exceeded social security and uh, expenses on national economy, which actually decreased uh, because of the war. So everything for the sake of the war. Well, uh, it is interesting that um, 
all this uh, lay down on the government perception uh, that oil prices will continue to be high next year. And uh, um, so Russia, Russian government predicts that it would be $85 per barrel, which is quite high. And it seems like uh, the efforts of uh, the West to, to prevent Russia from, uh, its, uh, for, for, from its oil bonanza will fail. Uh, well, uh, as far as I know, uh, Western countries are now working uh, uh, on a uh, uh, different way. How can they, how they can uh, close loopholes for Russian government to circumvent sanctions? Uh, but still, Russia, um, the Russian, the Russian government and Putin feels itself quite confident uh, in terms of uh, oil streams. So they are putting very optimistic uh, forecast um, into the budget. So. Um, the second way how they are going to finance uh, the war um, uh, the war next year and well the the, the last part of uh, 2023 mm -hmm. is the gradual devaluation of national currency uh, it brings inflation as you all may know but it's not a problem of today so it basically I mean it, it also indicates that uh, Russian government has no plan long going plan that they are going to well they're living only with the one day they're living only on the today and with inflation will fight probably next government or when inflation <laughs> comes they will tame inflation when it comes but right now they're focusing on milking economy to get some extra money for um, to, to spend it to military industry companies if we will look at the economy, we can divide it to two big parts, the military one and the civil one. And the military part of the economy, and when I'm speaking to this, I mean not only military industry complex, which itself provides armory and weaponry and weapons, but also uh, civil industries who serves the front line. There, it's multiple industries, and this sector is expanding. For instance, um, on three shifts, uh, working close enterprises in Russia because they're making uh, uh, uniform for armed forces. Then we're speaking about uh, food producers who are producing food for the soldiers, for the drafted men in the front line. Logistics who serves the whole bunch of uh, uh, industries to get uh, this stuff uh, to the front line and many, many other industries. So this sector, so this uh, military industry sector is expanding and it's dragging resources out of civil sector. All this leads to all this combined with the brain drain because you're probably familiar with the with the two waves of immigration from Russia last year. The first one uh, we and I was the member of the first wave uh, in 2022 um, after shortly after the invasion was started, and the second one was when the mobilization was announced. So combined to this, Russia now facing extremely. Uh, extreme labor shortages and this labor shortages also puts uh, a natural limitation to expansion of the economy which basically means that if that uh, the economy itself has no resources to expand to increase out so they shortly can increase output for uh, short-term reasons but for long-term development they has no enough resources uh, which also indicates that there is no plan. So the plan is to keep uh, the war uh, at, the, at the current stance. And uh, well, later they will, uh, uh, later Putin and his government will figure out what to do, which means that they, 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 they betting on their patience. Um, recently, we were evidence the fluctuations with ruble exchange rate. And uh, uh, this also, uh, uh, indicates uh, and uh, so ruble exchange rate became a function of state expenditures because Russian industry military industry complex very is very dependent on imports and for imports uh, Russia needs currency so basically <laughs> it's that uh, um, uh, as more as Russia wants to substitute imports more uh, to, to make import substitution and produce its own uh, goods and produce its own um, um, and produce its own stuff, more imports they need. So it's all inflating uh, currency ch exchange rate, which disturbs people, especially this. Um, this, sh this shaking environment is not comfortable for Kremlin enough, as we see now, uh, before the elections. So uh, recently, the um, um, capital controls was, uh, was imposed. 
Uh, capital controls also indicates growing pressure on financial leadership, uh, on Russian finan current financial leadership, especially on central bank from the government, well, because of upcoming elections. So capital controls allows government, so it makes uh, exporters to bring back its uh, export revenues back to the country and sell it to the market for the sake of uh, rubble. <clears throat> So rubble would be double digit, and when Putin announced that he is going to run uh, in the, the elections, well, basically win it, them in the March of 2024, uh, a background, uh, his background, uh, his especially economic background will be quite bright, and he can brag that Russia uh, sustained the sanctions. Well, partly he is true. Russian economy performs relatively well. Uh, especially if uh, we're keeping in mind that it's under 13,000 sanctions, more than Iran, uh, uh, North Korea, and, uh, well, Cuba combined. <clears throat> but, um, but of course, uh, it's, but, 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 but all this economic growth and economic performance relates on oil revenues and on uh, its expanding military industry complex. So once the war ends, uh, I wouldn't say the economy will collapse, but it will face a structural shock because it would be the great elimination of demand from this military industry part of the economy. <clears throat> so, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of some social uh, outcomes uh, for uh, the war, uh, what we see now that. Uh, uh, this summer, um, Russian authorities adopted some so-called wartime legislation, and uh, um, uh, State Duma adopted um, multiple laws uh, which uh, prevents people to leave the country, which uh, um, um, especially those young people who would uh, who will, who can be called to military service, uh, they create a lot of different different levels of punishment to people drafted uh, or just called to like they say like they say we just want to get some information on you we're not drafting you we just want to i don't know to know you better <laughs> but, uh, but 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 all these people are not allowed to take loans they're not allowed to leave country they force uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, uh yeah, so uh, on previous, uh, it, uh, but, but it also means that previously uh, that brain drain uh, brings a lot of pain to Russian government. That's why they forced to uh, to bring a legislation. Uh, um, uh, it, it is also it is also a problem because when you are bringing a legislation adopted by a parliament, it, it is it's quite complicated to cancel this. Uh, so it's also an indicator that uh, Putin wants and Putin expects the long war and uh, probably he bets that the political cycle in Europe and here in the States will change and the situation would be more favorable and the new leaders who come uh, would be more would be more eager to uh, negotiate uh, to whatever he uh, uh, whatever he wants. It is also it's still unclear how the presidential elections will uh, um, will hold and will the uh, world, uh, especially the West, will recognize the elections because uh, probably the, 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 there is a big issue of voting process on uh, occupied territories on uh, annexed territories, and uh, well, basically there is no uh, trustable statistics. Of what kind of people are remain there? Are these people still Russians, or they hold both Russian and Ukraine? documents so how they will vote and how these votes can be count there was a the, 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 it was a problem of this so-called referendums uh, which Russia conducted on these territories uh, but uh, well which also creates a very interesting sociological problem that uh, the well, the borders of Russia are now very murky, and uh, well, basically, no one can say where is the Russian border exactly. And before, and we haven't such problem before twenty two. Um, uh, speaking about uh, what it means for the world. 
uh, for you, uh, I, I would say that for Europe, uh, the slow war means uh, at first uh, keeping a big eastern neighbor in a very reactive state. So whatever European politicians will do or will say, it's uh, immediately will turn against them uh, by Russian propaganda. And uh, all my contacts with uh, European policymakers and with European experts shows that uh, people in Europe are quite sensitive to this. Uh, also to these issues so and all this creates a not very i would say not very constructive and not very productive um context which uh prevents policymakers being pragmatic they usually use emotions uh, on their decision making and this doesn't help for instance, uh, if we look on sanctions, uh, uh, and I divide them on three major categories. The first is uh, economic sanctions uh, imposed on uh, imposed on uh, parts of the economy, parts imposed on industries or on financial sector. Then a big bunch of personal sanctions imposed on policymakers and Putin's inner circle and oligarchs. And the third one, we're calling them moral sanctions, which uh, bears the whole Russian. Uh, passport holders who are now struggling in Europe getting visas. Some of uh, Russian activists are stuck in the post-Soviet countries uh, and they are <clears throat> And they face danger to be uh, extradited, uh, extradited back to Russia because uh, the ties between uh, these countries and Russia are quite um, tight. Uh, so. Um, and these people struggle to open bank, in, in opening bank accounts, in finding jobs, and so they face all problems. Uh, of so besides uh, problems which all migrants face uh, when uh, forced migrants, especially uh, who are forced to leave their country, live their life, uh, and for 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 a better uh, future, they also uh, feel segregation by the color of the of of their passport because they're Russians. That's that that's the new reality of you. Europe. Uh, it also means, uh, also a long war means that uh, extended war, um, war budgets uh, will continue and you both uh, United States and Europe countries will spend more money on military industry complex and less on the other uh, parts of the economy. Uh, which is in terms of, in general, in macro terms, it's not super great because military industry complex, it's not very productive. Usually it's not very productive industry. It creates additional value, but on a, but on a very limited stance. So uh, it's, and it, it doesn't bring to, I mean, to the global, uh, even on national level, uh, well-being, but mostly to the well-being of certain um, <coughs> industry. Uh, uh, there is one more thing I will, I will point your attention is uh, the very interesting problem that Russian authorities now creating with uh, redistributing assets between different uh, kind of owners. And it's related, this related not only uh, Western owners who uh, has assets in Russia, but also uh, but, but, but also Russian owners who has assets, um, you know, who has assets in their own country. One of the outcome of the war, the division of the world in Russia to friendly and unfriendly countries. And in terms of regulation, it's quite a dangerous thing because there is a list uh, which can be um, transformed by the very non-transparent decision of the government. And uh, for some countries, and, and it's done like this. So uh, today your country is friendly and tomorrow Russian government can decide uh, that it's non-friendly, which uh, brings some implication, which puts some pressure on, uh, on the owners of the businesses. And uh, this process, uh, first, of course, it it's opens the a huge room for the corruption. Second, it brings huge distortions to the process of investment and on investment climate itself. Because, well, Putin is 71 and uh, anyone, uh, it, 
I, I mean, literally anyone, even someone the worst, even we imagine that someone the worst will come. He will face the problem of investment in Russia. And uh, I think, uh, well, in my, in my opinion, and then and my experience shows that uh, where, that Eastern investors, I mean, from Asia, from the Gulf states, are very attentive to this kind of uh, regulation changing. And, uh, and well, that, that, this is, that, that, that was the problem in London with Indonesian capital when London imposed its bribery act in the middle of uh, in the middle of tense, when they experience when they faced uh, outflow of uh, capital from Indonesia because they said, okay, so today in London, as, as, as one Indonesian uh, investment banker told me, so today, well, they today don't like uh, capital from Russia, Azerbaijan, and post-Soviet states. Tomorrow they will have some problems with Indonesia. That's why we need to consider in other jurisdictions to, uh, uh, to, to, to do our businesses. So uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of environment, in terms of climate, it is a very bad and a dangerous step. But it also creates a huge mess with the titles and with the property rights. And uh, this mess uh, were created on the both sides on the first uh, in Europe for foreign, um, well, mostly it, it relates to, foreign, uh, to, to, to European owners because uh, well, it's not so many property, not so many assets owned by U.S. Uh, investors. U.S. investors had li liquid assets and they are locked up uh, because of the capital controls imposed in March 20, back to March in 2022. But uh, all this marquee ownership is also all, all it, it, it is it, it is also a problem of tomorrow or the day after tomorrow because there is no experience of restitution and uh, one day when uh, Putin will uh, will we'll, we'll step down or will be eliminated this problem will face and which creates first a lot of job for lawyers from Russia, from uh, Europe, from the US, uh, from from everywhere, but then it is it creates also a very bad environment because uh, you cannot build a strong and solid economic ties if you don't know who own, who owns uh, which assets and how all of this operates. I think I will stop here. I will open for the questions, and if you need some clarifications, please tell me. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you for your. Uh, thoughtful remarks. Let me ask a few questions and then I will turn it over to uh, all of you. So one of the things you mentioned in your discussion of uh, Russia's budget plans for 2024 is that um, the, the budget plan shows a decrease in the budget deficit alongside an increase in revenue largely from the oil and gas sector. And so I wonder how might fluctuating global oil prices and the G7 uh, oil price cap, which Russia has managed to circumnavigate, uh, affect Russia's uh, budgetary plans? And what might the implications be for the story you described with rising uh, military and social spending? And with its growing dependence on uh, oil and gas revenues uh, in the face of sanctions, is Russia becoming uh, what it was often uh, caricatured to be, a kind of true petro state or a big gas station for the world? Yeah, well, uh, big gas station and true petro state, it's a, good, uh, it's a good analogy, but I would say so there is, if before the war there was one needle, and there was oil needle uh, inside the Russian economy, so now there is the second one needle, and that's the military one because of the output because of the uh, and the expansion of a military industry complex so in terms of macro the situation the situation is quite good in the, in, in uh, today's figures for today's figures i would say the economy of germany couldn't brag uh, the uh, couldn't compare and couldn't brag uh, with the, the same uh, pace of uh, expansion so germany faced recession russia will grow to in some one percent this year but uh, uh but basically it, when, when we speak about economic growth it's not a uh, so th these numbers have nothing in common with people's prosperity or with people's well-being it's more about numbers created by additional state expended expenditures so yeah so it's it's, it, it's it's mostly on paper 
with a huge butt, <laughs> of course, with a few, of course, with a huge butt, uh, because the war created among Russian society, the war created a huge group of uh, uh, receivers of uh, social payments, of uh, war payments. That's the family. That's uh, I'm speaking about families of uh, drafted people, uh, families of PMC, uh, those who received uh, money from. Uh, for the uh, killed or wounded uh, relatives. And um, they, they also are interested in continuing the war. <laughs> well, because... So, uh, it is it is a very good and it is a very open question. Uh, will Russia sustain this kind of uh, expenditures uh, because uh, uh, because they mostly rely only on, uh, on oil... Uh, on, on oil, oil stream revenues. And I would say that uh, from the state budget and uh, from uh, revealed plan, uh, I don't see any options where Russian government can get some extra money. They are really literally milking to death non-oil and gas bi business. They're imposing more and more uh, tariffs. They're imposing more and more payments from business. And uh, well, they probably can, but, but, but the, uh, they probably can maybe, I wouldn't say, they, pro they probably can balance 2024 if they will cut some other expenditures, but, uh, they, but there is no plan uh, beyond uh, 2024 at all. If uh, the, the, um, I think they need to keep in mind Russian government need to go. I don't. I, I. I cannot read their mind. I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, they are pr quite pragmatic and uh, very market minded. So, uh, uh, so there should be otherwise. So they keep. Uh, they need to keep in mind that probably the West will someday will be successful in uh, circumvention uh, sanctions, or will find a way how to prevent Russia to use its shadow fleet. Well, anyway, Russia is already invested in shadow fleet, so it's already existing. And uh, as far as I know, more than 60% of Russian oil now uh, <clears throat> moves through this uh, shadow fleet, so it's invincible to sanctions. In terms of the war creating uh, winners and losers in the Russian economy, and we're seeing uh, some cuts to uh, things like education and healthcare, how do you think that will impact the social fabric in Russia? I mean, is this a sustainable model going forward? It is a very, it's quite a tough question because uh, what we saw now in terms of social dynamics, uh, first, we saw a massive brain drain of active, young, and educated people from Russia because they, well, some of them don't want to be a part of this uh, mess, and some of them uh, they disagree with the full-scale and unprovoked invasion or with, against Ukraine. The second wave of uh, immig of uh, immigration was quite pragmatic, so there was young men who don't want to be killed or wounded. Uh, some of them, I would say, I don't, I, uh, probably you, you would be surprised, some of them are, uh, came back uh, because of, uh, because they see that, well, it's like, so there is no signs of the second wave of mobilization. So probably they will, I don't know, they will figure out how to, um, <clears throat> Uh, how to uh, how to avoid uh, how to escape from if the, the new mobilization uh, how to escape from drafted service, but there are more opportunity more and more opportunities because of the brain drain because there is a lot of vacancies opened because uh, salaries and wages are growing in Russia also because military industry complex is expanding and civil sector is forced to uh, well because they need workers they are forced to uh, raising salary to, to, to raise salaries to people to just to keep them working uh but it also uh, in terms of i in terms of moral dynamics it is very interesting how people shortly become indifferent to the war to suffering of different people and continue to live their lives as long as they are not emotionally involved to the process it is um 
it's not the field of my research. And here I will rely on the words of my colleagues who do uh, social uh, research and social studies. But it seems like a big part of Russian society consumed the war as Netflix series. So it could be quite entertaining. I would say, and I'm very sorry of saying this, and I'm very sorry for my country. Um, so, and that's definitely will have um, some long-lasting outcomes and some long-lasting consequences, uh, which are damaging for the whole society. But what else? Most educated people, and this related not only to young people, but also to university, uh, to teachers, university professors, uh, all, all those people who disagree with the general line of uh, the government are forced to be silent or to leave the country. And that's also the effect of globalization, I would mention. When the previous, um, previously, this kind of regime killed this type of people, and now they are free to go. Yay. So uh, another question I have is, uh, since the start of the invasion of Ukraine, Russia has become much more dependent on China economically in terms of uh, supplying oil, but also receiving uh, certain uh, Western dual-use goods, uh, such as semiconductors. So China is proving to be a, a crucial lifeline for Russia in terms of uh, its war uh, effort. Uh, and trade between Russia and China is booming, expected to reach around $200 billion this year. Um, my colleague, Professor Chris Miller, who co-directs the program, has argued that every time Russia has tried to pivot to Asia, historically, the realities have fallen short of its expectations. And so how would you characterize uh, Russia's current turn to the East? Uh, and uh, does it have a, a kind of permanence? Has Russia been able to realize its economic interests in its partnership with China? Well, uh, Russia, uh, Russia, you know, <clears throat> Friendship is growing, and as you correctly uh, mentioned, um, it will exceed this year $200 billion, and that's the high record. Uh, but the also oh, the but uh, the balance is um, but the balance in this relationship is is uh, shifted into Chinese part, which wasn't so uh, well in terms of trade. It was uh, the same before the war. But it wasn't so crucial for Russia because, on the other hand, Russia had premium European market and other markets. So now Russia, mostly in terms of oil, depended on uh, China and India. Uh, China is, as we see, quite reluctant in um, increasing uh, in, the, in, in, in in increasing supplies from Russia because of its uh, strategy of, of energy de 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 diversification. So, uh, um, ch ch so China trying to diverse and to and, and keep its energy safety. So they, they are also buy from Saudi Arabia, they buy from Azerbaijan as far as I, they, they, they are going to buy from Azerbaijan, they're going to buy from other countries. Uh, China is a very important market for Russian goods because, well, but, uh, and, and also Russia is important market for Chinese customer, um, um, customer goods and uh, uh, via China, as uh, we all now know from, in the, from, from, in, from investigative journalists, Russia gets a lot of uh, banned, uh, a lot of sanctioned goods and uh, especially uh, goods of dual, dual use items, uh, chips and semiconductors. And it's very easy to hide from, um, from, from international watchdogs in, uh, in, the, in the large amount of, uh, of um, the Russian Sino trade. Previously, as far as I know, uh, China wanted Russia to share some uh, critically some critical technologies, especially in terms especially in terms of military production. I and we know nothing about uh, was about shared Russia with China now or not. There is a, nothing about this. Uh, so. 
I would say I, uh, but, but but what 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 do, what do I know for sure that Russian government and Russian businesses are not very happy of dealing with China. China um, dealing with China has it's 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 different from dealing with the West and Russia. Well, pr- well, actually, Russians feel themselves as Europeans, as the people of Western culture, culture in the very broad sense, and um, they struggled uh, previously in in negotiating something with uh, its Chinese counterparts. Sometimes Russian uh, behave themselves towards their Chinese and Asian counterparts very arrogant. So, and what they see, the, and, and China is also um, quite reluctant putting uh, direct investments into Russia. What I mentioned about uh, um, division on friendly and unfriendly countries, Chinese investors are very careful in reading such kind of signals. So uh, they are trying to create a so-called, I would say some kind of shield uh, on their investments. And what we see now that uh, banking business of Chinese uh, subsidiaries, Chinese banks with subsidiaries in Russia are expanding. And these banks usually served um, uh, Chinese payments, so they're quite secured from Russian financial system. And <laughs> so basically China, um, so it's, it's, it's quite complicated to explain in terms of in transactional terms, but uh, sometimes Chinese money are even, uh, so, pre- so uh, I will give you an example. Uh, before the war, there was lots of Chinese tourists who came to Russia with the big buses, and uh, they visit. Um, uh, they, 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 they made the great queues for Russia in Russian museums. I mean, honestly, Russian people lamenting that they couldn't uh, get to the museum because they need to spend uh, hours, literally hours, in the queues because of the Chinese tourists who were who actually formed these queues. But uh, but besides uh, payments for enter um, admission fees, Russian economy would never get uh, a penny from these Chinese tourists because there was secured uh, a souvenir shop. Uh, hotels, uh, restaurant chains, where, which served this uh, touristic flow from China into Russia. And that's basically, uh, Ch- so Chinese uh, businessmen now expanding these practices to other uh, kind of businesses. So, uh, basis, uh, so basically Russian economy doesn't see a big part of this, of this Chinese money because it's rounding uh, within uh, Chinese financial system and its extension uh, uh, to Russia, which represents by Chinese banks. So uh, Russian authorities are not very happy of this partnership, but because of war and because of the current stance of uh, uh, Russian regime, uh, they are not in the position to object. And it's interesting because uh, you know, almost paradoxically, uh, there were some Chinese companies that left or curtailed their operations similar to Western companies when the war began. But I wonder if you have any predictions, will we see more Chinese uh, investment in Russia in the years to come? I don't feel that it would be, I don't think that it will be uh, investment in terms of money, but it would be a very sophisticated and very interesting partnership if Russia will share with China some technologies or some stuff that China has uh, um, uh, haven't yet. Hasn't, um, uh, and uh, so I think so in terms of russia in relationship somewhere there, I investigated once the transactional process, uh, so-called ionization of Russian economy, but I find that it's, well, there was simply, so Russia simply uh, mm, substituted dollar with yuan, uh, but pricing is still in dollars, so it's not a real ionization actually it's just uh, big but 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 it is a signal that yuan can be uh, a very easy substitute to dollar so it's probably a signal to uh you to to to, to us fed but uh, there is nothing uh, but, but but i wouldn't say that that this kind of uh, that these transactions will um will bind russia to china so I have many more questions, but I'm going to ask one final question and then uh, open it up uh, to all of you. Uh, and uh, my last question is about uh, policy prescriptions for the West. Uh, we see that 
uh, sanctions have not really been enough to undermine Russia's war effort. Do you have any policy recommendations for the West in terms of developing a long-term strategy for containing Russia? Uh, could sanctions be tightened in some places? I think you alluded to that. Uh, how could we uh, get non-Western countries to refrain from helping Russia at the very least? Uh, uh, might secondary sanctions be effective there? Uh, how could we encourage further Russian um, capital flight and brain drain? So <clears throat> I would avoid direct policy recommendations because, uh, well, I can't be prosecuted for, uh, for any policy recommendations in terms of sanctions in my country. Uh, but more broadly speaking, uh, so in terms of relations with uh, uh, with other countries, I would say that sanctions is a very great indicator that something wrong, something was extremely wrong in relationship with Global South, which actually helps Russia and fulfill Russian budget with oil, uh, oil, oil stream and uh, seems like, and they are quite okay doing this. And even... Uh, uh, and, 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 and even now, when, for instance, European politicians telling something uh, to Indian politicians, uh, the Indian guys can say back to Europeans, hey, look, you have a war in the middle of Europe. Stop, Stop lecturing us. And that's, that, that that's indicates a huge problem, I mean, fundamental problem and relationship between uh, uh, the West and Global South. In terms of sanctions and its adjustments, I would recommend to watch uh, precisely on uh, capital outflow. And what we see that, uh, so there is two, li two lines of sanctions uh, on, uh, cap on capital outflows, uh, uh, outflows uh, uh, to Russia. The one, the external one, was imposed by Western countries. And there is also the internal one imposed by Russian Central Bank and, uh, and Finmin. Um, uh, back um, in March 2022. But besides all this, <clears throat> all these lines, the capital outflow in 2022 was more than $240 billion. And <clears throat> this year, uh, I think I think it's data on 1st July, maybe 1st August, I don't remember, but it's not relevant. Uh, Russians uh, kept uh, outside of the country more than $70 billion, which uh, combined to the expenditures Putin uh, spent on the war during 2023, which also means that uh, there is no trust from Russians, from Russian people and from Russian corporates to uh, Russian financial system. And... Uh, and, uh, and without any regard to these two lines of sanctions, people and corporates are finding the ways to withdraw money uh, from Russia because there is no trust in there. And I would say, so if you want to bring more pain, uh, let them bleed, let this money flow. Just, uh, it's contrary. Uh, so usually sanctions are banning something. And here, I, I think would be much more smart to open something, to create some you know, rooms for this kind of Russian money, which uh, will be withdrawn from Russia, but so which means that they never will be used for to finance the war. Uh, Russian will buy Tesla or Tesla stocks or Apple stocks or something like this on them. Or, Probably property in Montenegro, but uh, the, but but this money will never go to uh, will never finance the war. Will never be they will never return to Russian budget as taxes. And uh, well, the Russian financial leadership is quite smart. So when they find out that uh, the capital outflow is so huge, they will definitely impose more restrictions on this. But that would be problem of Russian authorities, which creates a huge, which creates the political risk to them inside the country. But it wouldn't be uh, the problem of uh, Western countries, and uh, there would there wouldn't be an argument for Western uh, policymakers uh, from uh, 
uh, that, that is, uh, sorry, Russian propaganda couldn't say that it's all about Western policymakers who impose the sanctions. No, there is no sanctions. There was uh, there was restrictions by your own government. So there, that, that creates internal political risks, not, not, not external ones. So I would say be smart, uh, be controlled to intuitive, and probably this is the path to, to success. And with that, uh, we are open for questions. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, Alexandra. Um, uh, yeah, my name is Gio. Um, I have like uh, I have a question that has like a few parts. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that Russia is not thinking about the future, like it's thinking about like trying to get the Ukraine and win and win the war like here and now and spending uh, money in the military industrial complex. Uh, that being said, um, how much? Uh, how much resources do you think Putin can like spend like in this military industrial complex and like until one of the three things happen? Either Ukraine loses, either Ukraine wins the war against Russia, or they or Putin is like or Putin is like ousted, or it, or like if like they end up going into debt because they are spending a lot of money. Also, um, like, uh, do you think uh, Putin like has is 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 has his eyes like on other Eastern European countries besides Ukraine, like um, in terms of like uh, former former European nations that made up the Soviet Union, even if they're now part of NATO? Like, do you think he's willing to like ex expand besides the Ukraine, besides the Ukraine, and like risk World War Three from happening? Also. Um, like, do you think in the future, like, it, like um, that, like uh, the Russian people will have like an, an, enough in terms of like overthrowing Putin's regime and like the people in his inner circle, kind of like how during the Russian Revolution the communists overthrew the uh, Tsar Nicholas II and the uh, Russian bourgeoisie, and you mentioned like how like a new leader in Russia like we'll just continue the same policy um we'll, we'll walk in putin's boots, footsteps so do you think like uh, a new leader like if like when some when putin like dies or like leaves power do you think like a new leader will actually like uh, be better for russia like we'll try to change russia for the better and what do you think russia's future will be under that new leader like do you think like there would be um a, a united strong Russia or like it would divide into different countries, kind of like how the Soviet Union divided into different countries. Like basically for the fourth question, do you think Russia will still be Russia even when Putin is long gone? Uh, I know it's a lot I threw your way. <laughs> <laughs> so so some of them, uh, the questions may not necessarily be about Russian political economy, but uh, you're welcome to, to answer them as you see fit. Okay. so. Um, uh, do I see that uh, Russia will be Russia with no Putin? There is a famous Volodin, uh, that, that, that there is a Russian duo, the parliament speaker of Vladimir Volodin, who owns uh, the thesis that there is no Russia without Putin. I disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia was before Putin and the Russia remains uh, after Putin. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I think that um, I, I don't believe in uh, So there, there is a very a famous school of thoughts that Russia will collapse as a result of uh, this war or that Russia will collapse. And there is a, even a debate on the, which borders uh, the, the state will collapse. I don't think I, I think Russia will survive after Putin and uh, after this war. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see any possibility of uh, Ukraine, uh, of, of uh, military victory of Ukraine, unless uh, the West will provide uh, more and more weapons. But providing weapons creates also, the, 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 it, it creates more additional problems because uh, uh, sophisticated weapons required uh, qualified personnel. Otherwise, uh, you're using microscope uh, for, I don't know, for cleaning. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so, 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 so here is also a problem. Uh, and, and, and it's a problem uh, both for Russia, for West, for Ukraine, that there is no image of peace for Ukraine yet. Uh, and no one, um, I don't see any debate uh, in the, well, 
that, that there is some sort of, but I wouldn't call it debate in Russia, but the, about, about the image of peace for Ukraine, long, uh, long lasting peace for Ukraine, which is extremely important, not only for this uh, poor country, but also for the whole European security. Uh, speaking about uh, how, how we how much Putin has resources to spend on the war. Well, as I said, next year, Russia uh, are going to spend more than a third of its uh, state uh, budget to the war. It, uh, on, the, on the government projections, uh, uh, war expenditures decrease in 2025, but it's means nothing in terms of uh, um, in, in terms of economic for, forecasting because uh, well uh, that the budget is a function of policy in Russia and if Putin remains well he can live long uh, and he definitely will win uh, elections in the, and if the war continues uh, I would um, I would say that uh, the amount of expenditures would be relatively the same. Um, unless the West wouldn't be successful, <laughs> unless the West doesn't invent any uh, options, how Russia close the loopholes for Russia to circumvent sanctions. Did I ask your questions? Uh, uh, yeah, um, more, more or less. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you for a brilliant presentation. I also have uh, several questions, but I will ask only one because to, to, to give opportunity uh, other people uh, ask. Uh, towards uh, so-called beneficiaries of the war, people who uh, get payments uh, from governments uh, for killing uh, fathers, brothers, sons, uh, husbands, for wounded wow. persons and so on. Do we see that uh, these people are becoming uh, real beneficiaries, because uh, according to my impression, uh, these people are remaining to be poor. They they are getting this money, but uh, they they are not able to convert this money into um, into the fortune, into the cap uh, real capitals. They uh, they live like you know uh, lottery winners. You can win billion dollar, and uh, in five year, uh, years you, you will find you, yourself again in, in a low middle class uh, if you're a lucky guy. Uh, so what do you think? Um, it, 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 it is a very good question. Uh, so compared to the uh, compared to the previous uh, level of life of these people, uh, in their eyes, because they consume more in terms of its daily um, consuming, they think that they become richer and uh, on the daily basis, it makes them more happy. Uh, I mean, uh, so previously they could afford themselves only, I don't know, food and clothes, and now they can afford themselves food, clothes and uh, plasma or a notebook or car or a mortgage. Uh, which also subsidized by government. So in these terms, they feel themselves much more richer, of course. And I don't think that they uh, have some plan on what they are going to, how they're going to live in five years. And we'll see probably the, we, we, we will definitely see the decrease uh, in the level of living of this, uh, so uh, this group of people well, uh, because one day, sooner or later, the war need to end, or it need to turn from its a hot wave to the cold one, hot phase to the cold one. Of course, uh, the uh, um, of course, if the if if the if the tensions remain, so we would be some sort of a cold war. Uh, work uh, industry will work on the to fulfill the stockpiles, and it will soften the shock. But why do you need to work three shifts uh, to fulfill uh, the warehouses? So, th so there will be definitely a decrease in the, um, in life in, in life of, of these people. But th that's what I said. That's not a problem of today. It's a problem of tomorrow. It's a problem of tomorrow government. Even if it would be the same government, it would be tomorrow. 
And uh, I, I asked a couple of uh, people in Moscow about this, pro the, the, on, on a very mi macro level, the problem of elimination of demand if the war ends. And I couldn't get some relevant answer, it's, uh, which brings me to the conclusion that they don't have it because they don't have time to think about it or they don't want to think about it. I don't know. I, I can see from here. But uh, it, it, it disturbs in terms of my concerns towards the whole country. But that's their choice and that's their way how to make uh, decisions. In the back. Um, yes, I have a question. Um, uh, Alexashenko recently he he uh, gave a speech in DC, probably last month, and he said that um, that um, during the Perestroika time or early nineties, basically Russia had two major priorities: building rule of law and uh, economic reforms, market economy. And he said that compared to that time, in case of, uh, let's say, some democratic changes in Russia, the economic sphere wouldn't be the first, it shouldn't be the first priority because Russia more or less has already market economy and, uh, let's say, democratic forces should put their efforts to build rule of law. But still, um, there are a lot of economic problems in Russia. What what do you think? Um, what should be done in the economic uh, sphere, like as a first priority or top three priorities, in case of democratic changes, from your perspective? Um, I would say that. Uh, uh, um, I would say that, uh, the, uh, that the problem of rule of law and uh, market economy are quite connected. And as I said, as I mentioned, the problem of state property and the market titles, uh, that's, uh, the, 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 in, in my opinion, it would be the first priority uh, which need to be solved. And this uh, problem uh, related both to rule of law, because it's, uh, the, um, it's required independent and uh, or even quite skillful uh, judiciary system, not uh, not like uh, not like now we have pozvanochne prava or uh, well that's when someone call that's when so, so, so someone calls and uh, you'll have uh, the favorable court decision, uh, but. Uh, and, uh, and 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 it's also and and the problem and, and the current problem is also creates in. Uh, it, it also lays in the field that uh, some decisions of, for instance, foreign uh, asset owners who were forced to sell their uh, assets. So there was uh, so the, the, so there is a legal basis on these decisions, on these forced decisions. So uh, as, as, so here, as I said, it requires both economical will and uh, very skilled, very crafted, and very accurate uh, um, judiciary system uh, and uh, political will uh, to create the environment of rule of law. So here is the first one. The second, of course, uh, I, I, I totally agree that market economy is more resilient and, and well, basically, uh, uh, Russian economy uh, sustained mm -hmm. under uh, this uh, under sanctions pressure because of its market origin. If it would be planned economy, I would say that it would it, it, it collapsed. So uh, it would do so, so, so I think that uh, very careful work uh, required to um, to cancel all non-market steps, which uh, which were done, it, which brings the which brings distortions in long-term perspective, but not in the short term. That's why they can be if shortly they are canceled, like capital controls, in, for the sake of financial stability. Sometimes capital controls are serve. Uh, for good, but they of course create a lot of problems if they become a part of economic statecraft of uh, of the state. So uh, cancel this kind of decisions, and uh, I would say privatization, like because uh, we have now a lot of uh, government-owned companies. First, I, I think first we no 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 I think. 
uh, government-owned company do not means uh, that's not mandatory leads to ineffective uh, management. But media. Uh, that's we're um, we're, <laughs> we're three steps behind media. We're steps three steps <laughs> behind coming media. We have some we have some problems before that. And uh, speaking about privatization, as I said first, uh, we need to solve the problem with titles and with uh, property rights. Uh, then canceling and uh, market decisions and what 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 should be third. Um, it's it, 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 it's not laid down in the middle of, in in the field of media freedom or creating some sort of. Uh, I I I I think it should be efforts to create the environment of trust to bring people back. So it would be and what 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 it can be it's 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 a huge work with uh, uh, security forces illustration and all this part of job. So we're still far be <laughs> from, from from media freedom and all and all this stuff. So first we need to to dismantle this uh, this siloviki apparatus and then um, and then go to some humanitarian issues. That, 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 that's how I think. And of course, remain the current level of uh, uh, economic and financial leadership because they are, well, they, they, they show themselves quite effective. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, I want to just uh, get your view on this, um, the IT shiki, the they outflow of IT personnel and, and the technology people. So the numbers are somewhere between 800,000, 900,000. That's the number I see quoted. And it's the Financial Times had an article today uh, about the returning of people returning. Because the longer the war goes on, the less likely people are to stay in. I mean, they're sorting themselves out. Either you're deciding to stay permanently in another country or you're getting tired of waiting and you go back for reasons that you described. And I think that then, you know, this is a phenomenon that happened in the 90s as well, right? With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the West uh, benefited greatly from Russian scientists who came here and took part in our technology sector of many important people. But it seemed like we had this idea that this would really cripple the Russian economy. It doesn't seem that that's the case, and it doesn't seem like it's going to be it, it, the longer this goes on. I mean, it, there's just people are sorting themselves out one way or another or getting tired of living in Georgia and not being liked by Georgians and Liz living you know, in Armenia and having to decide what side they're on, that they're filtering back. And I, I don't know what your, your thoughts about this are and what that means in terms of the economy. Um, it's uh, so the numbers of uh, who came back are quite significant in terms of immigration. So I think, I, I, I think that it's ex exaggeration that 800,000 uh, people left. I think it's what it, it's less, like 500,000. Uh, I'm not a demographer here, but I'm doing uh, quite often the reality check with uh, credible demographers. Uh, and uh, the, and uh, that's more their is, uh, assessments. Uh, the uh, flow of those who are coming back is quite significant, approximately from 10 to 15 percent of those who left. Uh, first and um, uh, very important that those who left are not only IT people. And uh, if we're speaking about IT people, we need to always to keep in mind that it's not only those programmers, coders, but also people involved in digital marketing and uh, or, or other digital um, occupation. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's yeah. all it's, it's it's all related to digital, but it's not uh, particularly uh, those who creates code or who creates additional value in terms of IT. Uh, it mean, it seems that uh, Russian leadership are quite uh, they they were quite terrified of uh, this uh, brain drain, and uh, they are trying to 
um, well, Maksud Shadaev trying to protect uh, the remained IT people from uh, being drafted, the imposing uh, some uh, subsidized uh, mortgages and subsidized loans for IT people so to them to remain in the country. Uh, it doesn't work uh, good. It works a little bit, but doesn't work good. So, uh, so which means the, the, the top is already gone. Mm -hmm. It's paradoxically, it creates opportunities for those who remain and those not super skilled people who cannot find themselves mm -hmm. in the world market. Uh, that creates for them opportunity to return and then uh, improve their well-being for a while. Well, uh, for, for in the midterm or in block the or long term, this well-being will be eaten by inflation, by shrinking freedom, and uh, all other uh, outcomes of uh, the current stance of regime. Uh, but uh, I I don't think that uh, those who already left mm -hmm. could be replaced. But uh, that's uh, but, but, but 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 the question I'd like to I like to tease my brains is uh, are the low qualified IT people replaceable by generative AI? Mm -hmm. It seems that yeah. uh, this stuff can be quite uh, skillful in not very sophisticated tasks. I mean, mm -hmm. I use it uh, often for some for some stuff and find it's quite significant. And if this kind of technology can bring uh, some sort of boom in, uh, pro in productivity for in uh, for white, uh, white collar uh, professionals, uh, well, it could benefit kind of uh, uh, regimes like Putin or Xi Jinping, or we can learn something new about Iranian innovations or so. Question here. Yeah, um, I don't, I'm not sure. I saw the statistic, I think, from the IMF today of how Russian unemployment had decreased, at least statistically speaking. But I guess one, one, one of your kind of thoughts on that, and if that was relevant, if it was because of the brain drain of people leaving, so there's maybe more jobs, or how does that affect things economically? Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, um, uh, Russia experienced huge labor shortages. It is a natural limitation of uh, economic growth and on expanding on that's so on unsustainable uh, and potential economic growth um, because. Uh, well, in terms of why, in terms of uh, blue collar, low qualified, of course, some of those who left, or uh, also uh, military industry complex and the war and work itself creates a huge pressure on labor market, because uh, well, young men were removed. Basically, they were just simply removed from the labor market, and uh, what the, 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 they're not the, they're not producing anything right now. So. 300,000 uh, people, as Russian authorities uh, told us, it's, it is a significant number. It is a significant figure. So um, some of these people could be replaced by migrants, which also creates tension between uh, among Russian society, because Russian, Russian society is extremely white and uh, quite not tolerate to minorities. These are the migrants from Central Asia? Mostly from, so mostly from Central Asia, yeah. Um, it is. It is. A, it would be a good question to me. I don't know the answer, and I will probably. You know, it's, it's came to my mind uh, just very recently that there is a Belarus, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then probably Russian society would be more tolerated to the Russians rather than uh, to people from Central Asia, but uh, mostly yeah. And so. Uh, as we see, unemployment is on its historical low level and uh, wages are growing. It's also, it, it brings pressure on inflation because it brings pressure on, because uh, uh, from the side of consumer demand and uh, all, and all these people consuming imports, which also brings pressure on exchange rate. Uh, so, and um, there is no, uh, there is no good way of resolving this kind of situation. Even if all uh, people uh, who left Russia come back, Russia has a very bad demography. It's aging country. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is, it is, so yeah, it is a problem. Uh, it is a problem without any solutions. I just have some short amendment towards the question of workforce. We uh, usually uh, we are talking only about uh, Russians who emigrate 
from Russia. But uh, we uh, usually forget about several hundred thousand workers from Ukraine who worked in Russia before 2022. Mm. Uh, they left. We uh, usually forget ab uh, about the fact that currently Russia is competing for Central Asian workforce with South Korea and China. Because uh, currently uh, South Korea uh, is very active in recruiting workers in Uzbekistan, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, in Kazakhstan. I'm not sure about Tajikistan, but uh, it's a matter of fact. So uh, Russia lost not only soldiers uh, who are fighting or died, uh, not only immigrants, but also uh, gastarbeiters who previously came from, uh, from the Russian neighborhood. And we still need to count this number. Okay, Ukrainians, uh, this number is relatively clear, but what's about uh, uh, Central uh, Asian guys? Well, still, the inflow of migrants from Central Asia is relatively big. So I wouldn't say uh, and uh, there was no notices from market that uh, uh, Russia is struggling super. I mean, you know, that it's very painful uh, not bringing migrants from Central Asia to I Russia. Not in Moscow and St. Petersburg, but I, I heard from regions. Uh, it's, from people in regions who are emp uh, employers. So, so it's so so basically it's it's also can be like uh, Moscow will track uh, migrants from regions, uh, well, because of the salaries, because of the conditions, because of the also protection from being drafted and sent to the war, because Russia also imposed some uh, east uh, uh, east process of uh, getting Russian citizenship to migrants because. Russia need people to fight for this uh, useless and um, drastic war in Ukraine. Uh, so I would say, but, but it's 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 definitely it's definitely an issue. And uh, as long as Russian economy would be degraded because of the war, because of the sanctions, and uh, because of the lack of investments into economy, because the military industry complex uh, sucked all resources from the civil one. Uh, the competition uh, about which uh, Pavel uh, noticed would become more visible and more painful for Russia. So I admittedly had to go back and look up the equation for GDP, but I was thinking about just mathematically speaking, how long this could be kept up for where the G in GDP is actually accounting for most of import, most of export, most of income, and effectively we'll say 60% of the economy. It, at some point there's a declining population that is going to drive this into financial insolvency, right? Um, is the expectation that, you know, we're talking about 2030, like how much longer do you think Putin can leverage his balance sheet in this way? Certainly you said next year he's good, but there's gotta be a more long-term financial risk here that's not fundable through more bond issuances or any sort of monetary method to account for the rest of that GDP. It's a, it is a good question, but I would say for, uh, well, because it's more about numbers and calculation, um, as long as they are ready to spend money on, as long as they, as long as they're spending, they're growing. And so in terms of GDP, the GDP will shrink, well, because right. they, they, because they will spend less. But uh, how long? Good question. I don't think I, there, there, there is no, there, there, uh, if we're in terms of, well, James Maynard Keynes uh, teached us that with, with, with his, his theory of broken windows, that it can be perpetual in terms of the good calibration. Right. Uh, so I, I, I don't have an answer to a question. Or do you feel that there's enough of a resource endowment uh, if, to if, sustain this in perpetuity? As, even with investment as long as uh so uh 
let, uh, let, let, let's think about limitations what we have in this case. So the first one, we have demographical limitation. You mentioned that. Uh, we, would, we, we need to have a limitation in terms of capital. There is no limitation in terms of capital as long as uh, West consume uh, West and East consume Russian energy resources. So Putin has money on his disposal to spend it on stuff. Otherwise, there there need to be limitations uh, on capital from uh, other sides. We don't see them uh, yet. Uh, so, principles of capital, no limitations. People limitation we counted. What else could be? Um, Ah, technology is industrial equipment. Right, think about like Omni Anti, right? So, so like, technology, it's a technology. Uh, okay, technology is industrial. Uh, in terms of output, uh, in terms of uh, if you produce, if you are still producing less sophisticated, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, still, uh, but but weapons who who still can kill people. In terms of output, it's they're equal. Is it Kinjal or? Uh, or what, or is a simple or or an ordinary weapon? So in terms of technology, would be it would be still gradual uh, decline, but not uh, uh, but, but but not stop. So would you expect that there will be a push to um, grow Russia's population? There Something is there, there wouldn't to... be there, 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 no growing no. in Russian population. Growing here is excluded. Uh, it's it's impossible. Um, no way. Or otherwise, even if it's possible, it's not. It it, it, it doesn't give us any resources to solve the problem uh, today or even tomorrow. Right. Uh, yeah. So we need so 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 that it needs some time. So I, 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 I don't I don't know how they how they're going to manage the situation. It's a paradox. So they will show that there is also some something on social side which are not uh, taking into equation on GDP. Yeah. Uh, yes, go ahead. So, so just, you know, as a comment, right, what I've always, I always heard when I was in Russia is in Russia, in the U.S., business is more important than politics and Russia politics is more important than business. So political imperatives will take precedence over all of these things that we're discussing. In terms of the population, I know that even back in the 90s, there was this projection that Russia's population was going to shrink because of health, because of the, the lifespan. And I'm not sure that actually happened. And I, I, I think that the health system in, improved, the lifespan of people improved. I remember sort of riding with an oil worker and ask, him asking me what age you retired. And we say, I said 65 and he had laughed and said, ha, 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 we're, we, we're dead by the time we're 55. That's a big joke. So I think that there are ways in which this, that part of it are being managed or attempt to being managed. The whole incentives for large families, all that stuff, the Russian government was aware of and was trying to manage. And the resources available are not just oil. I mean, Russia is the largest grain producer in the world. It has strategic uh, production of nickel and other uh, important industrial metals and uh, and diamonds. So there's there are deep resources. Still commodities, but compared, it's, it's, it's still commodities. It's still commodities. Still... Yeah, first it's still commodities, and second, uh, compared to oil sector, and to expand it. Uh, and to go um, and, and, and and to these huge uh, expenditures, um, they cannot be funded by uh, export by export streams from grain. It's only ten billion uh, per year. Uh, okay. um, so uh, diamonds, I think, two billion per year. Nickel, less than billion per year. So they are kind of the, so this kind of expenditures cannot be funded. Uh, by other part, uh, by, 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 okay. by, by other commodities. So otherwise, uh, Russian government, of course, there is an option for Russian government uh, to, for instance, to stop the war, or 
not even not, not stopping the work, like, uh, stop funding other parts of the economy, stop building roads, stop uh, investing into health system or uh, decrease the investments to the necessity minimum. So it wouldn't be development, but just maintenance of the current level or not current level, but bearable level. Mm -hmm. You're completely right that uh, the health system improved significantly. Uh, and in terms of 30 years, it was just a massive improvement. And it's, it's, it's definitely, it, 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 it's um, directly connected to long living of Russian population, but still to, uh, to, to exclude the, limita the, the demographical limitation, Russian government requires much more time. Mm -hmm. And, and here, time plays um, in favor of political side of the regime because Putin is invincible to political cycle. He can remain there forever uh, uh, unless um, he, can remain, uh, um, he can remain there uh, forever, but, and, but European leaders will change, US leaders will change. And if Trump gets uh, uh, off, uh, office uh, next year, well, Putin would be happy, uh, I would say. Uh, so, he, so I see probably limitations and, and some options for good uh, um, allies in the political uh, side of the equation, yeah. So uh, I will collect a few questions since we have, uh, I think, uh, six minutes left uh, of the event. Uh, and I will also ask a, a question myself on this issue of political expedience uh, being prioritized over economic interests, one of the things you alluded to uh, earlier in your remarks was this issue of the nationalization or appropriation of the assets of foreign companies. And I remember in the beginning of the invasion, there were some uh, thousand companies that pledged that they would leave Russia or curtail their operations in Russia. Uh, I wonder if you could speak to uh, what the status is uh, of these companies leaving, because many companies have found it quite difficult to uh, retain or uh, salvage their investments uh, in Russia. And what has been the uh, economic effect of uh, the departure of foreign companies from Russia? Um, in fact, I think some economists in the beginning were saying that the short-term effect uh, was quite large and even perhaps larger than the imposition of sanctions. But I think today we may see a very different picture. Let me collect any remaining questions in the room. And uh, yes, go ahead. Um, yes, uh, you mentioned um, how like uh, Russia is currently suffering an aging uh, population. Um, that being said, um, do you think it will get to the point in the future will, that Russia Will heavenly will will heavily have to uh, demand on like um foreigners like um uh for like um uh like uh like um to do like a uh, to do like labor like um in the country and um and do you for and do you foresee like um there being like a uh how do you say like uh, do you foresee like a, a lot of challenges in terms of like um in terms of like uh I don't I don't want to say infighting, but in terms of um the new Russia of having like a lot of like people come coming there to like uh do jobs and like and then like uh people wanting like um assimilation or maintaining uh the way of life and also like a why um what do you think are the causes um, that are leading to the aging population? Why aren't, why aren't uh, a lot of young Russian people having uh, children? So I think some of this we addressed earlier when talking about uh, migrants from Central Asia, for example. But uh, Alexander, you can uh, answer uh, the, the question as you see fit. But please go ahead. I I, I need some clarifications here because we all, we already talk about uh, uh, the struggling between um, the, the, the possible problems uh, which can create uh, the active uh, um, involvement in Russian life of migrants from Central Asia. But uh, well, oh, like um, oh, so what, what kind of problem? Oh. Uh, aging population, young population, you mean, or 
Like I thought you said, like um, in in your talk, like I thought you said that like uh, Russia was suffering uh, from an aging uh, population, and like um, there's not a lot of um, not a lot of laborers in the workforce. Right. So, like I was asking, um, will will it get to the point where Russia will have to like incorporate like a lot of people, like whether be it Central Asia or from uh, different parts of the world, okay. to do like uh the, the labor and also like um like uh um the challenges that i will um create kind of like how like in western europe you see like um uh there's like a lot of uh pushback in terms of uh some of the some of the european countries not like uh, uh i, I not, think we understand the question yeah, yes yeah. there was also one last question yeah. over there yeah. um, uh it's so uh, uh, post the war, you know, like uh, how will the Arctic Circle, uh, you know, resources with the uh, you know political circle in Russia? Sorry, post war resource. Uh, uh, if if the long after the if the war gets from a hot phase to cold phase, okay, yeah, you know, how will the Arctic Circle play uh, in the equation of like political, you know, circles in Russia? That's what I so. About uh, this, uh, uh, about foreign companies um, who wants to leave, who left, and uh, who stayed. Uh, yeah, the, we, we all witnessed uh, at the beginning of the war uh, the huge uh, campaign from uh, Western companies that they are going to leave Russia. Uh, partly this campaign was uh, ballooned by uh, Ukrainian activists and uh, thank to them for doing this job. Uh, this, the, the, this is a very new extension of sanctions, mm -hmm. uh, which policymakers did not expect. Uh, neither policymakers here in the West, uh, as far as I know, we were, they were quite surprised about uh, this reaction of corporate world, nor the uh, Russian authorities who were extremely surprised that so many uh, firms decided to leave Russian market. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that, 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 that's the reason why, uh, so the capital controls was imposed mostly to save the remained reserves uh, of Russia uh, back in uh, May 2022. But uh, later restrictions on withdrawing assets, for instance, uh, 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 for instance, businesses cannot uh, withdraw from Russia their equipment, their physical equipment. Uh, it's quite an easy to <laughs> shut down your firm. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Western owners were threatened, well, basically Russians either, but uh, for Westerns there was they, 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 they expressed uh, that they felt uh, much harder pressure from Russian attorney general and from regulatory uh, bodies uh, not to do massive lay lays off. So uh, the, um, the situation with foreign owners is quite controversial. Some of them who were strong enough, uh, they left and that they fixed losses. They made uh, massive write-offs. Uh, but, uh, well, now they are quite safe and are from Russian market. Uh, some of them decided to stay, and I would say, uh, and uh, I regret uh, to say this, but they have uh, very mixed signals from some policymakers uh, within Europe that, well, probably the situation can be solved for good, so, they need those, so there is no rush with withdrawing your assets, with withdrawing your business. Uh, and, but, but, but I would say that uh, neither, but, but no one in Europe can guarantee uh, foreign, uh, for foreigners that they wouldn't be, that their assets wouldn't be nationalized by Russian government. For instance, and it, and it was in the press, that uh, they did the deal with Carlsberg, uh, who intended to, sold, uh, to sell its assets in Russia, was one step before it's uh, behind its final, final, finalization. But uh, after Putin's decree, well, 
uh, that <laughs> they've got nothing. Uh, so, but um, in terms of a local domestic economy, uh, the, the, this withdrawal created a very interesting effect. It's also created an opportunity. And I would say that uh, attitudes of Russian business uh, at the moment, if we will, uh, if we will not see on dynamics, but at the moment, we'll, if we will measure them, they're quite optimistic. And um, so, and there are a couple of reasons why they're optimistic. The first one is because they are, uh, because people uh, and businesses couldn't be sad the whole time. They couldn't be depressed the whole time. The second is because there were, they, they, they were created opportunities and market niche, which were fulfilled by Russian uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, they are growing and their profits are growing. But if we will look at the numbers of um, at the figures of import and capital outflows, it seems that the um, uh, big, biggest part of these profits are uh, withdrawing from Russia because there is no trust to financial system. So I would say that uh, the effects on this are quite controversial. But what was important about Western businesses uh, in Russia, it's also not only technology, but also the corporate culture and the culture of doing business. And uh, well, I could so I could foresee that in the midterm, the corporate culture in Russia will uh, go down because <laughs> because of the lack of best practices and uh, I mean, uh, Eastern corporate culture is also quite different mm -hmm. and uh, Russian uh, that the, 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 there is not enough uh, program to know how to uh, I mean educational program which is all which are also important uh, to um, to educate managers to educate uh, entrepreneurs so I would say I, I would predict some sort of degradation of um, corporate culture in Russia uh, going to migration, yes, it will, um, uh, as we said, it will create tensions on, uh, it's, um, it will create ten tensions among society and Russia is already on the position when it, uh, we need to attract more and more migrants from different states uh, because there is lack of for local workers and yeah. Post war resources. It it it, it, would be, it, it is an interesting um, it is an interesting question uh, about uh, a resources landscape uh, after the war ends or when to uh, return into its cold phase. Uh, and uh, it's uh, very closely related to the political stance of the regime. So who will remain in charge? If it would be Putin and it would be the Cold War, uh, I would say that uh, the stance of, uh, so, so, there is, so everything will remain relatively the same. So the landscape would be relatively the same. Uh, but anyway, uh, 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 yeah. But even, even if it would be some successor of Putin, uh, Russia will, will um, Russia will rely for a long time on oil and gas commodities on on this on on on, the, on this part of commodities, and uh, uh, because uh, well, it's it's obvious that sanctions uh, remain in place after the war ends. Both uh, ways uh, turn into cold stance or ends with the victory of Ukraine. <laughs> sanctions will remain so there would definitely be technological degradation which put limitation on russian technological development and diversification of russian economy unless generative ai which <laughs> capacity we do not understand yet great well on that note alexandra thank you so much for all the <laughs>